The news broke last week Wednesday. Diego Maradona is dead. A legend of the game of football, and arguably the greatest, according to some, passed away in his sleep at his home in Tigre, Buenos Aires, Argentina. The preliminary reports are that Maradona died of acute lung edema and chronic heart failure, but there are investigations and allegations surrounding his care in the last week of his life at the time of our recording. Hello everyone, this is Red Brad coming to you today from the Touchline. As I watched and read through countless Twitter and Instagram tributes and I watched footballers and organizations around the world pay tribute to this man who some call a god, I was struck by one particular comment. It reads, For Diego, I would go to the end of the world. But with Maradona, I wouldn't take a step. Well, we dive deeper into this and into the person of Diego Maradona, and we're back after this. He's found the space, and he's found the back of the net. Just a little off foot, thinking he's going to go far post. Not strong enough with his right hand. Whips that one in. Far post, almost made him in, and they have. He has the hat trick. The second in his career. The third of the night. The hat trick hero. Talked about you're not going to be able to sustain that kind of pressure. To the corner. Goes towards the near post. And you're on the angle. And what a goal. What a goal. For Diego, I would go to the end of the world. But with Maradona, I wouldn't take a step. That curious statement made by Fernando Signorini... Maradona's personal trainer in the 2019 documentary by Asif Kapadia on Diego Maradona's life, has stuck with me since last week. Now, I haven't seen that documentary yet, but earlier this summer, I did watch Netflix's Maradona in Mexico, which details Maradona as he coaches the second division Mexican team, Dorados de Sinaloa, in Culiacan, Mexico. As I watched that film, I saw evidence of Signorini's sentiment. There seem to be two sides to this larger-than-life persona of Diego Armando Maradona. I watched as he religiously would pray the Lord's Prayer before matches with the team, and then turn around and totally destroy someone with his words, almost like a raving lunatic asking, Who are you? Who are you? As I thought more about Maradona's death, I contemplated, as I typically do, a question I often ask a family for whom I'm officiating a funeral or memorial service for their loved one. In the moments as we begin to talk about the details of that person's life, I start to reflect on whom in the Bible this person's life reminds me of. And as I started to do this, as I started to consider Maradona, for some reason, I kept getting stuck. Perhaps it's because I don't feel like I know Maradona really that well. I've only seen him in the public eye. And I've seen and heard of his football excesses. I know of his personal struggles off the field. But I've not made this great, tremendous study of his life that would allow me to be some, some credit, credible or, or authorized voice. So I called a few friends of mine who understand the game and understand the Bible to help me a bit. But let me ask you, let me pause and ask you, if you were to consider someone in the Bible, for what person would the, the life and the story of Diego Maradona seem to be a mirror? If you know the Bible well, who would that person or that story be? What comes to mind? And no, Job is not the right answer. I'll give you a minute just to think about it. Now, truthfully, there never is a perfect example when these things come to be. But as doing this exercise, I find that there are commonalities and generalities. And the closest person that I could arrive at with my friend's help was the life of Saul, son of Kish. Saul was the first king in the history of the nation of Israel. And it's on Saul's life and reflections on Maradona that I would like to draw a few simple reflections. And to begin, Saul's name means one requested or one asked for. And if you know the history, the people of Israel were asking for a king. Israel itself had been a mess politically, spiritually, and in other ways before Samuel. Samuel was the prophet, the priest. Even Samuel's own sons didn't follow God the way he did. And so, as Samuel grows older, the people begin to ask for a king like the other nations that they saw around them. Uh, This bothers Samuel. But God tells Samuel, it's not you they're rejecting, it's me. And in spite of Samuel's warnings of what it will mean to establish a monarchy, to have a king, uh, the people don't listen, and instead they demand a king. The nation wants someone like the other nations. And if you read 1 Samuel 8.20, the author describes it this way. No, they said, the people of Israel, we want a king over us. 
then we will be like the other nations, with a king to lead us and to go out before us and fight our battles. Well, chapters 9 and 10 of 1 Samuel give us some insight in the person of Saul. We see some things. First, Saul is described as an impressive young man amongst the Israelites. He was a head taller than any of the others. We also know that Saul comes from a small tribe of people, and his clan being one of the less significant amongst that tribe, Saul really has some humble beginnings. And finally, we see that the hand of God comes upon Saul. Saul is a changed person from the inside out. He's transformed. And this uh, meek, meager, mild kind of person who maybe has some special gifts and talents, uh, certainly some physical attributes, all of a sudden we see him becoming more uh, like a king because God is with him. The hand of God is upon him. At the public announcement of his kingship, though, we see Saul is hiding. Uh, And so when it comes time to actually step forward, we see maybe this humbleness or this shyness or this timidity. Now, again, no example is perfect. But in reflecting on Signorini's statement, I think there was something to the person of Diego Maradona that was attractive and inspirational. Diego himself was born into a large Roman Catholic family, four older sisters, two younger brothers. He grew up in a poor area outside Buenos Aires. He received his first soccer ball at the age of three, and by age eight, he had grabbed the attention of a scout while playing a neighborhood match. Diego, as a person, as a player, was actually short in stature, but it was said that his, his size actually gave him an advantage over other opponents because he was able to move and dribble more quickly, and certainly his skill with the ball and his ability to get around people was unparalleled and perhaps one of his greatest God-given skills. Now, Argentina had won its first World Cup in 1978. Maradona was left off the squad. Only 17 years old, Argentina's head coach believed Diego to be too young. And four years later at the World Cup in Spain, Diego certainly had risen to be a, a name on the football pitch to be feared. But he was stymied by the countless cuts and tackles and, and the ways that teams would effectively shut him and Argentina down and out. That year, Argentina didn't get past the group stage. But four years later, Maradona captained Argentina and the national team to victory, World Cup victory in Mexico. Although it wasn't without controversy. And many people know this, but maybe for some of you that don't, really the controversy comes around his two goals scored in the 2-1 to one quarterfinal win against England. And I think that these two goals are perhaps a little indicative of the two different sides of Diego Maradona's life. The first goal was an absolute cheat. Maradona rose in the air and put the ball past English keeper Peter Shilton and in the back of the net by hitting the ball with his hand, which was close to his head. Now, despite the English appeals, neither the referee or the linesman got a good look, and so the goal stood. The goal is famously known today as the goal scored by the quote-unquote hand of God. And this came after Maradona in the postgame was quoted as saying this. He said that the goal was scored quote, a little with the head of Maradona and a little with the hand of God, unquote. Well, just a few minutes later in that same game, Maradona's second goal is a moment of individual brilliance, and it's still described as the goal of the century. Maradona received the ball from a teammate in his own half, and in 10 seconds, he outdribbled four English defenders to go 60 yards and score and put Argentina ahead two to nothing. Perhaps there's no better color or characterization of Diego Maradona's life and story than those two goals. In fact, the French newspaper El Equipe described Maradona as half angel and half devil. There is a part to Diego Maradona's life and football that is pure and innocent and beautiful. And like his wonderful goal of the century, when we see the story Like Diego, we cheer, we're filled with hope, the underdog wins, the one who was poor is elevated, the small, diminutive one conquers the giant. But there's a darker side, a side that dwells in the shadows, and I think this is why we wrestle with the greatness of Diego Maradona. Is his greatness truly earned, or has a corner somehow been cut? Has he cheated in some way to earn this? And how could our favorite son, our hero, from amongst the Shandyville hobbles of Buenos Aires, go so far afield? You know, Saul, like Diego, had his success as a king. He had his moments when he acted in the right, and he found favor with God and with the people. 
but it didn't take long for Saul to go astray. It wasn't long into his kingship, in fact, that Saul cheats. And we read in 1 Samuel 13 that Saul goes off on his own and he departs from God's commands. In 1 Samuel 13, there, the enemies of Israel are gathering around him, the Philistines, and everybody's a little bit nervous. People start running away and Saul's waiting for Samuel to show up and make the pre-battle sacrifice. It was something that only the priest, the prophet Samuel was to do. Saul gets nervous, so he takes matters into his own hands. He makes the sacrifice. And when Samuel shows up just minutes later after the act has been done, Saul is hardly repentant when he's confronted with it. Instead, he kind of excuses his actions and blames Samuel. The result, as we see from Samuel, is that Saul's kingship will not last. And in 1 Samuel 13, verses 13 through 14, we read Samuel's condemning words. You have done a foolish thing. Samuel said, You have not kept the command the Lord your God gave you. If you had, he would have established your kingdom over Israel for all time. But now, your kingdom will not endure. The Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and appointed him ruler of his people, because you have not kept the Lord's commands. Well, the rest of Saul's kingship might seem confusing to some because we see that there's still some success that Saul enjoys over his enemies, but I think this only makes the point that much clearer. We can mistake our role and our participation in the grander plans of God and ignore our own spiritual deficiency and cheating, as it were. You know, with God, we cannot cut corners and get away with things. And if you continue to read on in Saul's story, you'll see that God ultimately rejects Saul as king. And this is, this is even worse than, than Samuel saying, hey, your, your, your throne won't last. God eventually ends Saul's kingship. And as we begin to see a young David, most of you will know him from the story of David and Goliath. We see young David, son of Jesse, come onto the scene we see Saul begin to decline and deteriorate. We we see Saul begin to be tormented by a madness, by an evil spirit as it was. He becomes mentally unstable and he lives in fear from from one of his own. And David rises to have success in front of his very eyes and it it just makes Saul, it, it eats away at Saul inside. Well, Maradona had his continued successes for sure but he wrestled with some deep and dark demons. In the midst of his 1986 World Cup success, he was already far down the road of addiction to cocaine. It is said by the time he started playing for Napoli, a couple of years um, he had transferred in for a huge sum of money from Barcelona, that he was already a full-blown addict. And that cocaine addiction was something he battled until 2004. He was hospitalized for drugs, for alcohol abuse, there was a divorce with his wife of some 15 years, multiple affairs, financial problems, mafia mix-ups and tie-ins, and what many soon began to label as just erratic behavior. All these things are a part of the Maradona side of the story. Now, I don't want to carry the parallels between Saul and Diego too far, but I believe we can see something in both of their lives. First, We see what life can be like when the hand of God is really upon us. There are countless blessings in store. There are successes to be had, battles to be won. We can affect change, true change, as we go with God, as it were. I believe Diego Maradona knew something of God. Certainly, Diego was touched and gifted as a footballer. And I think at different points in his life, he saw and knew even what the deeper things of God were as well. One of my favorite stories is the time Diego reportedly argued with Pope John Paul II. And as he looked at the gold-gilded ceilings in the Vatican, all the while Pope John uh, bemoaned the, the needs of the hungry and the poor in the world. And Diego reportedly challenged him saying, sell your ceiling, amigo, do something. I think that betrays, uh, that gives us a glimpse, a hint at the Diego side of Maradona's personality. Also, I know that the current Pope, Pope Francis, an Argentinian, made a tremendous impact on Diego in his return to faith. The second lesson I think that we can learn from Maradona and Saul is a warning to us, and it's the way that we live. 
Don't cut corners with God. Don't take things into your own hands. Okay, a little pun intended there. Certainly Saul lost out on having a legacy, and he ultimately descended into a maddened state that left him resorting to witchcraft and all manner of self-promotion and self-preservation. In the little that I've watched of Maradona, there seems to always be a side to him that is compensating. His struggle with identity and confidence and peaceableness is evident. While some may mistake this as passion for the game or something similar, the truth is that for all that Maradona is or has been, it is obvious that it is never satisfied, and he has taken some shortcuts in life, some of which have had long-lasting effects. Well, friends, by no means is today's podcast meant to question Diego Maradona's relationship or faith in God. The truth is, I don't know. And it isn't for me to judge with any certainty or finality the condition of Diego Maradona's soul or his standing before God. But we can in confidence look at the two lives of these men, Saul, son of Kish, and Diego Armando Maradona, and see that beyond the pinnacle of the world upon which these two sat for a time, there are lessons to be learned. And if I were to sum it up into a sentence, it would be, one, that we ought to seek the hand of God in our lives, and two, that we shouldn't take matters into our own hands. If we will just serve the Lord with our whole hearts and not turn away from Him, it will go well with us, heart, mind, and soul. Today, as we come to a close, I want to read the words of the prophet Samuel after the people of Israel realized the mistake of choosing after a king. The people asked Samuel to pray to the Lord God on their behalf. And you can find these words in 1 Samuel 12, 20-25. Samuel replies to them, Do not be afraid. You have done all this evil, yet do not turn away from the Lord, but serve the Lord with all your heart. Do not turn away after useless idols. They can do you no good, nor can they rescue you, because they are useless. For the sake of his great name, the Lord will not reject his people, because the Lord was pleased to make you his own. As for me, far be it from me that I should sin against the Lord by failing to pray for you. And I will teach you the way that is good and right, but be sure to fear the Lord and serve Him faithfully with all your heart. Consider what great things He has done for you. Yet if you persist in doing evil, both you and your king will perish. Well, friends, with those words in mind, I want to close us in prayer. And as I do, a prayer for Diego and a prayer for us. Father, we place Diego Armando Maradona into your hands. Acknowledge a sheep of your own fold, a lamb of your own flock, a sinner of your own redeeming. Enfold Diego in the arms of your mercy, in the blessed rest of everlasting peace, and in the glorious company of the saints in light. And Lord, for us, as we grieve, as we remember Diego Maradona, forgive us our sins for idolizing and worshiping Diego Maradona unrightly, for using and placing hope in Diego wrongly and unfairly, for the ways that we have turned away from you, Lord, for the ways we have failed to respect and serve you, Lord. Keep us from evil. May we learn the way that is right and good. May we see the hand of God in our lives this day and forevermore. Amen. And this is Rev Brad coming to you from the Touchline.